All right, so um, we've got a lot to dive into today. You brought some Times of Israel pieces, and mm -hmm. well, the dates on all of them are October 1st and 2nd, 2024. And looking at all of this together, it really feels like, well, it feels like a really pivotal moment, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a lot to process, for sure. We're seeing a, uh, a real convergence of geopolitical tensions here. Yeah. Now I live in your embrace A new life found your grace is true The old has passed away The new has come to stay So heavy, but at your cross I found my rest. Your blood has washed away my sin. I've been restored. Where do we even begin with this? I mean, Iran firing 181 ballistic missiles at Israel. Mm -hmm. That's that's where we have to start, right? Right. That's. I mean, that's the big headline here, obviously. Right. And it's easy to get caught up in the sheer scale of the attack, 181 missiles. But I think it's important to take a step back and look at the context here. This didn't just come out of nowhere. So walk us through it then. What led to this? Well, for months now, Israel has been conducting covert operations targeting Iranian assets and personnel in Syria and Lebanon. These operations have been pretty effective, but they've also been kept largely under wraps, at least officially. But Iran has been sending very clear signals that they would not tolerate these attacks indefinitely, that retaliation was coming. And these missile strikes, well, this is their response. It's a pretty terrifying thought, though, right? I to think about all those missiles raining down on, well, on civilian areas, okay. you know? Yeah. And I was reading about the reporters in Israel having to, like, to take cover in the middle of broadcast as the sirens were going out. Oh, yeah, I saw that too. It's, it, it had to be absolutely terrifying for people on the ground. Yeah. yeah. And while, thankfully, the IDF, with help from the U.S. and Jordan, was able to intercept most of the missiles, I mean, can you imagine the kind of psychological impact an attack like that has? Right, and even if most were intercepted, there was still a school, I think it was in Gadara, that was hit. Right, yeah, thankfully no one was injured there, but it just... It really drives home the fact that these aren't just abstract geopolitical chess moves we're talking about here. There are very real human costs to this conflict. Yeah, no question. And then you have Netanyahu vowing retaliation. So it feels like uh, it feels like this is just the beginning. Yeah, I, I think that's a safe bet. Israel sees this attack as an act of war, and they've made it very clear that they will respond accordingly. The question is, how far will they go? And what will Iran's counter response be? And that brings us, I guess, to to the IDF launching that ground operation into southern Lebanon. That's a, I mean, that's a significant escalation, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And a risky one. It really highlights just how volatile the situation in Lebanon is. We're talking about a country where Hezbollah, a militant group backed by Iran, holds significant political and military power. And the goal of this incursion is to? Well, according to Israel, the goal is to dismantle Hezbollah infrastructure and allow displaced citizens to return home. But it's hard not to see this as a major gamble. A gamble in what sense? Well, any operation against Hezbollah carries the risk of sparking a wider conflict. Remember, Israel and Hezbollah fought a bloody month-long war back in 2006. And the region is arguably even more volatile today than it was then. So what are the potential consequences here? If this operation escalates, what are we looking at? Well, in a worst-case scenario, you could see this spiraling into a regional war, drawing in not just Israel and Hezbollah, but also Iran and potentially other regional actors. So the stakes are incredibly high. Incredibly high. I mean, we're talking about the potential for a conflict that could have devastating consequences for the entire Middle East and beyond, frankly. And we're talking about this like it's some kind of, I don't know, some kind of geopolitical thriller. But this is this is real life. This is happening right now. Exactly. And I think I think that's something that's easy to lose sight of when you're looking at maps and troop movements and talking about strategy. But at the end of the day, these conflicts have a very real human cost. There are families being torn apart, lives being lost, futures being shattered. And that's something we can never forget. It's a lot to process. Mm. And and this is just the beginning, right? I mean, we haven't even gotten to we haven't even gotten to the terror attack that happened in Jaffa on the same day as uh -huh. the missile strikes. Right. Yeah. In all the chaos of the missile attacks and the situation in Lebanon. Well, it's easy to forget that there were other things happening that day, too. This wasn't just some, you know, some isolated incident, though. We're talking about a coordinated attack, multiple casualties. He's a horrific attack. Two Palestinian terrorists. They opened fire on a crowded street near a Tel Aviv light rail station. Seven people were killed and many more were wounded. The articles quote some witnesses. Yeah. 
And the things they describe, it's just, it's hard to even imagine the chaos, the fear, people running for their lives, not knowing where to go. It's, yeah, it's heartbreaking. And it really underscores the fact that even when we're talking about these larger geopolitical conflicts, like we were just talking about, yeah. the impact on the ground on individual people's lives, it can be, well, it can be devastating. And this attack in Jaffa wasn't the only one that day, right? Yep. Right. There were actually multiple attacks. The articles mentioned a stabbing attack that also occurred in Jaffa earlier that same day, as well as a shooting attack near Hebron. Thankfully, there weren't any fatalities in those attacks, but... But it still creates the sense of of just constant fear and uncertainty, you know? Absolutely. And it raises the question of whether these attacks were in any way connected to the escalating tensions with Iran and Hezbollah. I mean, it's hard to imagine they weren't, right? It is. The timing is certainly suspicious, and it's not unreasonable to think that there might be some connection. Mm -hmm. But at this point, it's still too early to say for sure. But even if they weren't directly coordinated, it still feels like, well, like this is all part of some larger pattern, you know, like the violence is it's contagious almost i think that's a good way to put it and it's something that we've seen time and time again in this region one event can trigger a cascade of others and it can be very difficult to contain the violence once it starts to spread so where do we go from here i mean is there any way to stop this cycle of violence that's the million dollar question isn't it and unfortunately there are no easy answers but i think the first step is to acknowledge the complexity of the situation we're not dealing with a single conflict here, but rather with a whole web of interconnected conflicts, each with its own history, its own grievances, its own actors. And to make matters even more complicated, all of this is happening against the backdrop of a U.S. election. Oh, yeah. I mean, talk about timing, right? The U.S. is in the middle of this incredibly contentious election. And here we have this major international crisis unfolding at the same time. It's hard to overstate just how significant this is. Because it's not just about, well, it's not just about U.S. foreign policy, right? It's about, well, it's about the future of the entire region, potentially. Exactly. The U.S. is a key player in the Middle East, whether we like it or not. And the outcome of this election could have a profound impact on the region for years to come. So how did the candidates handle all of this? I mean, they were asked about it during the debates. There right? were. In fact, one of the articles you shared covers the vice presidential debate, which took place on the same day as these attacks in Israel. Wow. That uh, must have been something else. Yeah. It really puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Here you have these two candidates debating domestic policy, health care, the economy. And then suddenly, they're thrust into this conversation about war and peace in the Middle East. So what do they have to say? Do they offer any solutions? Well, it's, it's complicated. I mean, it's always complicated with these things. But I think their responses were pretty telling in terms of their overall approach to foreign policy. Let's start with J.D. Vance, the Republican candidate. What was his take on the situation? Vance was pretty clear about where he stood. He expressed strong support for Israel, saying that they had every right to defend themselves against Iranian aggression. And what about a preemptive strike on Iran? Did he address that? He did, and he basically said that he would defer to Israel's judgment on that issue. He said something like, it is up to Israel what they think they need to do to keep their country safe, and we should support our allies wherever they are when they're fighting the bad guys. Wow. So a pretty hawkish stance then. You could say that. He definitely didn't mince words. Yeah. And his comments were met with cheers from the Republican side of the audience. So how did Tim Walls, the Democratic candidate, respond to all of this? Walls took a different approach. He was much more critical of the previous administration's handling of Iran, arguing that they had actually made the situation worse. In what way? Well, he argued that Trump's decision to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal had backfired and that Iran was now closer to developing a nuclear weapon than they were before. He said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically said that Iran is closer to a nuclear weapon because of Donald Trump's fickle leadership. So two very different perspectives on the situation then. Exactly. And I think those perspectives really reflect the larger debate happening within the U.S. about its role in the world. Which isn't. Well, on the one hand, you have those who believe that the U.S. needs to take a more active role in global affairs, that it needs to be willing to use its military might to protect its interests and its allies. And then on the other hand, you have those who believe that the U.S. needs to be more restrained in its use of military force, that it needs to focus on diplomacy and cooperation. And these two candidates, they kind of embody those two different viewpoints. Exactly. And it's, well, it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out, both in the election and in the region itself. I mean, the stakes are incredibly high. 
it's a lot to think about, you know, the potential for a wider war, hmm. the U.S. election, and then just the, the human cost of all of this. It's, it's easy to get lost in the geopolitical weeds. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think that's why it's so important to to bring it back to that human element, you know, because we're not just talking about abstract concepts here. We're talking about real people, real lives that are being well, that are being upended by these events. It's easy to forget that when you're looking at maps and, and reading headlines, you know, it all feels so, so distant somehow. Yeah. But then you read the accounts from people who were there on the ground during those attacks. And it just it hits you like a ton of bricks. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's what we have to remember, even as we're as we're trying to make sense of all of this, you know, that these aren't just these aren't just stories in the news. These are people's lives. So so how do we even begin to process all of this? I mean, mm -hmm. we've got, well, we've got Iran launching this massive missile attack yeah. and Israel responding with a ground incursion into Lebanon. Mm. And then you've got this terror attack in Jaffa. And all of this is happening against the backdrop of a U.S. election that, mm. well, that could have major implications for for the entire region, really. Yeah, it's it's a lot to unpack. And I think you're right to to highlight the complexity of it all because... Because there are so many moving parts here, yeah. and it's easy to, to get overwhelmed by it all. But I think if we're going to to even begin to understand what's going on, we have to to break it down a bit, you know. So where do we start? Well, I think it's helpful to to think about it in terms of of cause and effect, you know, because yeah. because none of this is happening in a vacuum. Yeah. So so let's start with the Iranian missile attack. What do you think was the primary motivation behind that? Well, it seemed like, well, it seemed like retaliation for. For those mm -hmm. covert Israeli operations that, that we were talking about earlier, right? The ones that are targeting Iranian assets and personnel in Syria and Lebanon. Exactly. Iran had been warning for months that they would retaliate if Israel didn't stop those attacks. And this missile barrage, mm -hmm. well, that was their way of, of making good on that threat, right. I guess so, you could say. So one event leads to another. And then you have Israel responding to the missile attack with, with this ground incursion into Lebanon, yeah. which is, well, that's a pretty significant escalation, isn't it? It is. And it's a risky one because you're talking about, <laughs> well, you're talking about the potential for a much wider conflict. Mm -hmm. Remember, Hezbollah has a lot of firepower at their disposal okay. and they're backed by Iran. So this could easily spiral out of control. And then in the middle of all of this, you have the terror attack in Jaffa. Right. Which, yeah. which just adds another layer of complexity to an already incredibly volatile situation. Because even mm. if that attack wasn't directly connected to the, the Iranian missile strikes or this IDF operation in Lebanon, it still underscores the, the deep-seated tensions in the region. And it raises the very real possibility that, well, that this violence could spread. And that brings us to the U.S. election. Which, I mean, talk about bad timing, right? I know. It's it's almost surreal, isn't it? You have this this major international crisis unfolding, and it's happening right in the middle of a of a U.S. election that, well, that could have major implications for, for how this whole thing plays out. So it's like, it's like all of these different threads are, are converging at the same time. Exactly. And it's mm -hmm. impossible to to untangle them completely. But I think I think it's important to try to to at least understand how they're connected. So where does that leave us? I mean, what can we even take away from all of this? Well, I think the the biggest takeaway for me is that the world is a very messy place mm -hmm. and there are no easy answers. That's that's for sure. And I think I think it's important to to remember that the warring when we're thinking about these issues, you know, because it's easy to to get caught up in the the black and white of it all, but the reality is it's much more complicated than that. There's a lot of gray area. A lot of gray area and i think the more we can the more we can embrace that complexity the better equipped we'll be to to actually engage with these issues in a, in a meaningful way and that's what we've tried to do today on the show we've really yeah. well we've really gone deep on this well, i have it's been it's been a fascinating conversation it has and i think i think we've only just scratched the surface really yeah. but hopefully hopefully this has given our listeners uh a better understanding of the the complexities of this conflict uh, and the the stakes involved. Absolutely, and Ron. if and if nothing else, I hope I hope this has inspired our listeners to to go out and and learn more about this because it's it's an issue that's not going away anytime soon. No, it's not. What I thought was really interesting, and I hope we can kind of dig into this a bit, is you've also included some reflections on these events uh, through a biblical lens, and it's like, okay, we see what's happening in the world. But then how do we process that through, you know, the lens of our faith? And I think that's where things can get really, really interesting. Well, you said it. I mean, this is a multifaceted issue.
And to really get a grasp on what's happening, mm -hmm. we need to be paying attention to both the immediate situation on the ground and then what the potential fallout from all of this might be. Totally. So before we even get into, you know, the biblical prophecies and all of that, just for context, can you give us a clear picture of what is actually happening right now in Israel based on these sources you sent? Yeah, absolutely. Both of the sources that you sent paint a pretty consistent picture. Basically, Israel is under attack. They're being hit with these missile strikes. And it seems like a lot of the attention and the blame, if you will, is being directed towards Iran. Yep. Um, and so there's that. But I think what's more concerning is that a lot of people are saying this has the potential to get much, much worse. The U.S., of course, has pledged their full support to Israel. So you've kind of got the whole world watching this thing very, very carefully, seeing which way it's going to tip. It's like a powder keg. It really is. And that's what's so unsettling, right? It's like, where does it go from here? And this is where I think the biblical aspect comes in, because you mentioned these sources connect what's happening to biblical prophecy. And specifically, they mention that phrase wars and rumors of wars as a potential sign. And they talk about this idea of eschatology. So for those of us, and I'm including myself in this, who might not be totally up on our theological terms, can you just break down what exactly eschatology is? Yeah, for sure. It's one of those words we kind of toss around, but it's good to define it. Eschatology is basically the study of end times. Okay. It's the study of the ultimate destiny of humanity, the fate of the world, all of that. And pretty much every religion has their own form of eschatology, right? It's this idea of what's going to happen at the end. Right. And of course, within Christianity, there's... Uh, you know, there's a bunch of different interpretations. I mean, you've got your premillennialists who believe that Christ is going to return before a literal thousand year reign on earth. Yeah. And then you've got amillennialists who say, well, that thousand year reign, that's symbolic. Right. So it gets, it can get pretty complex. It does get complex. But within those viewpoints, is it common to connect current events, especially what's happening in Israel right now, to biblical prophecy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, particularly for people who hold a more premillennial view, seeing Israel in the headlines, especially with everything else that's going on in the world right now, it's easy to draw those connections. But, you know, it's just important to remember that within Christianity, there are a lot of different opinions, even about something like the end times. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that really struck me, even with all of this talk of prophecy and potential, you know, end time scenarios, both of these sources really emphasize responding with faith over fear. Yeah. And there's this one quote that I wanted to highlight. It says, scripture tells us not to live in fear, but to remain steadfast in our faith. And I think that's really powerful. But what does it actually look like to remain steadfast when everything feels so uncertain? Yeah, it's easy to say, don't worry. Right. But when you're actually in the midst of something that feels really scary and uncertain, how do you not worry? And so for me, when I think about that idea of being steadfast, I think about like a ship out at sea. When a ship's out at sea, they drop anchor and that anchor digs into the seabed and it holds it firm even when the waves are crashing all around. And I think in a lot of ways, our faith is like that anchor. Mm. It's what keeps us grounded when the storms of life, or in this case, the storms of what feels like global events, are swirling all around us. Yeah. So how do we cultivate that? How do we cultivate that kind of steadfast faith? And I know both of these sources really point towards prayer as being a key response. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, what is prayer but a conversation, right? Yeah. And it's a conversation with something bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, praying for peace in the Middle East, praying for peace throughout the world. That is a way to tap into something that is bigger than us and to kind of align ourselves with this idea of hope that there's something beyond just these circumstances. And there's this idea of spiritual vigilance that comes up as well. How do we balance that, right? Because it's easy to slip into fear-based thinking, but then how do we stay spiritually alert and aware without constantly you know, worrying about the sky falling? Right, and I think that's the key difference there yeah. is that fear paralyzes us but vigilance empowers us. Mm. It's like the difference between, you know, running to the store and hoarding toilet paper because you <laughs> think the world's ending versus being like, okay, I'm going to stay informed about what's happening. I'm going to prepare myself the best that I can, but I'm going to do it from a place of, you know, trusting that I have the resources to face whatever comes my way. You know, it makes me think of that verse. I think it's Matthew 24.36 where it talks about how no one knows the day or the hour right. you know not the angels not even the sun mm -hmm. and it's like we're not called to pinpoint the exact date and time but we are called to be ready yes 
yeah. 100%. We're called to live in a state of readiness, yeah. not a state of panic. Right. Like, yes, these things are happening. Yes, we need to be aware. But we don't have to have it all figured out. And we never will. And that's where I think, you know, this idea of God's sovereignty comes in. Because if we accept that, you know, God is in control, that brings a certain level of peace, even when we don't have the answers. Absolutely. And that's really what both of these articles point to, this idea that ultimately true peace, lasting peace, isn't going to be found just by solving all the political problems. Right. We can't just sign a peace treaty and have everything be okay. True peace, the kind that transcends all understanding, it comes from surrendering to this idea that even when things seem completely chaotic and out of control, nothing is outside of God's love. Nothing is outside of God's plan. You know, for someone like me and maybe you listening out there, we are constantly bombarded with information. We're bombarded with bad news. It's so easy to just spin out and feel overwhelmed. But there's something about this idea of God's sovereignty, this idea that God is ultimately in control. It's like permission to just exhale, you know? Yeah. Like we don't have to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. That's good. Yeah, I like that. It's that reminder that even when we don't have it all figured out and we want, we can rest in that truth. Yeah. And I think if this has resonated with you at all, if you're feeling this pull to kind of go deeper on this topic, I really encourage you to, you know, do some digging, check out some resources from, you know, trusted theological sources, maybe have some conversations with people at your church, your faith community. I think this is one of those things that the more we engage with it, the richer it becomes. A hundred percent. In a vineyard lush and green, where the grapes hung low and sweet, Worked a humble keeper with dirt upon his feet. He pruned the vines with tender care and watered them each day. For he knew the harvest coming was not so far away. Oh, the vineyard keeper with patience in his hand tends the vines of life in this blessed land. Through the seasons changing, through the sun and rain He nurtures every branch And relieves every pain One day a drought came raging With the sun's relentless blaze The vines began to wither In the scorching summer days But the keeper didn't falter He knelt upon the ground and with his tears and prayers, new strength the vines had found. Oh, the vineyard keeper, with patience in his hand, tends the vines of life in this blessed land. Through the seasons changing, through the sun and rain, he nurtures every branch and relieves every pain. The vines began to wither in the scorching summer days But the keeper didn't falter, he knelt upon the ground And with his tears and prayers, new strength the vines had found Oh, the vineyard keeper, with patience in his hand Tends the vines of life in this blessed land through the seasons changing, through the sun and rain, He nurtures every branch and relieves every pain. When the harvest time had come and the grapes were full and fine, the keeper gathered every fruit, the work of love's design. And though the path had not been easy, with trials in between, the vineyard thrived with abundance in every shade of green. Oh, the vineyard keeper, with patience in his hand, tends the vines of life in this blessed land. Through the seasons changing, through the sun and rain, he nurtures every branch and relieves every pain. So trust the vineyard keeper when your soul is feeling dry. 
For he knows the perfect moment when to lift your spirit high And when the time is right, in the light of his grace You'll see the fruit of patience shining on your face